welcome to That 30 Show, a podcast where we talk about the good, the bad, and the surprising parts of our 30s. I'm G, and I'm finally 30. I'm excited to find out if 30 really is the new 20, because if it is, then the best years are yet to come. And I'm David. I'm entering my mid-30s. I used to have no back pain or trouble sleeping, but now I live off a healthy diet of self-help books and dream of being in bed by 10pm every night. Join us each week as we try to figure out together what life in your 30s is all about. Welcome back to That 30 Show. Welcome back to David. Oh my gosh, long time no see, pal. Yeah, and with the bi-weekly schedule now that we're doing, it's it's been a while and uh, yeah. missed everyone. I'm glad to be back. Uh, thanks for holding down the fort uh, last episode. It was it was a great, it's a fascinating conversation. You know, I, yeah. I bumped into a colleague the other day who uh, listens to to the podcast and she's like, yeah, I've been catching up. Like I've been uh, on top of it. And, and then she's like, yeah, it's been interesting. Like you've had someone who was divorced on and then now you have someone who broke off their engagements. Yeah. Like it's fascinating. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. All the crazy life whirlwinds and like unique experiences. I was like, I, you know, we know people that have gone through these experiences. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it definitely is relevant, right? Like in your, in your, in your thirties, I think that's the decade where you start hearing of people whose marriages don't, don't work out, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was a great conversation. Thanks for having that. Yeah. Well, that was great. But um, while I was doing that, you were off doing something fun-ish. You were on vacation. Yeah, yeah I was. I, I had time off. Uh, it was a, a bit of an unexpected trip, but you know, a vacation mm -hmm. nonetheless. I still had a chance to visit my family, my partner's family. So yeah, it's a, it was a vacation. We had we had some time to squeeze in a, a couple of fun side trips here and there. Uh, you know, I went to Japan for the first time. I don't know. I always it's it's always tricky because I went to Japan when I was a kid with my family, mm -hmm. but my entire family got food poisoning. Oh, so we gosh. stayed one night. My sister was so sick that she went to the hospital, and then the next night we took an emergency flight home. And I remember when we were at the oh, airport, like we all had like high fevers, we we're just dying. So like, does that count? I spent a night in Osaka, but like, anyway, so this was my first proper time yeah. in Japan. And, and how of, was it? Speak, well, speaking of food poisoning though, like this is the thing, like I think not just, so every year G gets food poisoning in January. That's a thing now, <laughs> right? G eats oyster. Well, it's not going to be a thing next year. Knock, Knock on, on wood. wood. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but like I went to Cuba a few years ago and I got pretty bad food poisoning there. I went to the hospital, you know, yes. got the whole IV drip. And this year I was in China and I got food poisoning again and I went to the hospital again. <laughs> oh my gosh. Between the two of us, how many times have we had food poisoning in the past? Whatever. Um, do just, you, are you an adventurous eater? Like, do you try a whole bunch of like things that maybe you're not supposed to eat or do you stick to the safe stuff? I think yes and no. I think I'm not an adventurous eater sort of by nature, but because I'm going to these places like Cuba, like, well, China's not that exotic, but like I'm accessing, I think, food that my body's just never been exposed to. Mm -hmm. So it's like, basically I'm, I'm exposing myself to bacteria that I'm just not used to. And, and water know, maybe too. Growing, yeah, like maybe just growing up in Canada in a Western culture, it's just a lot more sanitized, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, yeah. So my body's just pretty fragile, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think it's anywhere, especially the water. I remember when we went to Italy, they were like, oh, this is one of the, you know, the cleanest like water that you can get, like natural water. And they have fountains just on the streets where you can just drink out of like, it's just spewing water. And then you can grab a water bottle and just put your bottle under it. But I was still scared to do it because I was yeah. like, I don't know. I mean, emotionally, that makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, but like maybe yeah. rationally, <laughs> it, it makes sense. It's Dirty a water on the street. <laughs> Yeah, vacation, it was a reminder, honestly, that I don't know if I'm just getting old or I'm just playing that, oh, I'm so old card, but I'm kind of over it. I'm over the traveling in a certain way. When I travel now, I want to go, I want to be in bed by 10 p.m. every night. <laughs> I want to have rest days like every two, three days. <laughs> like there are so many times when, you know, there'll be plans the next day. I'm just like, oh my gosh, again, yeah. I have to set an alarm again. Like this is not restful. This is not restorative. And I think what I'm looking for in vacation now, whether it's because of my age or because I'm just really boring or combination of both, I want my vacations to be very restorative and restful. 
Hmm. And so a week in, I'm just like, get me back home to my routines, to my checklist, to my cold showers, to eating three fruits a day. Like, <laughs> get me back to my routines. I'm done. Maybe you'll change your, maybe you'll try, have a change of heart about all inclusive vacations now. Maybe that's like yes. where you're headed to. Cause you're yes. so like, like against I, that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I had a lot of like backpacking hostel, a uh, solo backpacking hostel trip adventures. Yeah. Not a lot, but a, a good number, uh, a number of years ago, I did go on a cruise with my mom uh, a number of years ago as well. And that was actually amazing. And now I'm mm -hmm. thinking like, yeah, I think that's the kind of vacation I want. <laughs> Something that was good, I guess, because it was a more family oriented trip. So it was cheaper than usual, right? Like we're not paying mm. as much accommodation or mm -hmm. any really. So that was good because I certainly, I don't know. I just feel like almost irresponsible in this economy to just go off and splurge on a big vacation. So I'm glad it really happened. It gets this expensive. Time. Yeah. It gets really expensive, yeah. especially when you're going for like a few weeks, because if you think about it, like the amount of accommodations that you have, to, like every single night for two, yeah. three weeks, and then, yeah. you know, food you can kind of do at home, but like the accommodations and the travel is a lot. I remember one of your New Year's resolutions, I think you mentioned was was financial management or something like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted like, I, to I, sort of eat out less and have a budget on my like, not entertainment, but just kind of, yeah, going out to eat and things like that. So how's so, that going? It's, February, it's almost March or two, two months in. Yeah, I've been pretty mindful about it. So like I'll, uh, I like kind of pick and choose what, cause I used to go out to like everything. Like if people ask, unless I'm busy or whatever, then I'll be like, okay, sure. But now I feel like I'm a bit more mindful where I'm a bit more pick and choosy about what I go out and do. Are you trying to save for something? Well, I want to save. So I, I want to go on vacation in the fall. So I want to like save up for that. But just in general, I think shifting my habits over a little bit to like mm -hmm. less spending and more saving. That's yeah. sort of where I want to go. Well, that's actually what I want to talk about today. And I know you have okay. a different topic. Yeah. But this week, class is back in session, and we're <laughs> going to do another lessons on episode. Hopefully, mm -hmm. people like that. And I want to talk about a book that I read while I was on vacation, and it's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Housel? Okay. Very, very famous book. You, have you heard about this book, or have you read it? I've heard about this book. It's always on the like um, top 50 nonfiction, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should read it. Oh, actually, now you don't need to because I'm going to spend the next, I don't know, 20 minutes. You can teach about me it. everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of themes in a book that are about this, right? Like, what are you saving for? How, like, how do you, how do you save more? Why should you save more? Like basically the psychology is the key word because a lot of times mm -hmm. when we look about, when we think about money and investments and finance, it oftentimes, um, we think about it as a very technical thing. Like, so like, Oh, I don't know, you know, options, stocks, like shorts, and I don't know, bonds, like GICs, like all that, mm -hmm. like it's a very technical, but in mm -hmm. the end, there is a reason why the subject of economics is a social science. Because mm -hmm. ultimately money and the markets and the economy is driven by irrational collection of human beings making decisions that yeah. uh, are not based on science. That's why you objectively and categorically cannot, categorically cannot predict yeah. recessions or, uh, or whatnot with a high degree of accuracy. Mm -hmm. So this book kind of helps unpack that aspect and helps us understand exactly the psychology of money, essentially. <laughs> You know, th there's a lot of points in the book. I, I've distilled it into eight points slash eight questions that I'll pose to you and then sort of elaborate on. Okay. Um, and so in our, I think hopefully for folks listening, uh, whether you're in your twenties, thirties, forties, I guess it doesn't really matter, but I think your thirties is definitely a time when money and savings and investment like really comes to a head because in your twenties, if you're doing that, it's almost like, wow, like you're kind of. You're the, like the businessy guy. You're the finance guy. You're ahead of the curve. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's now that you're in your thirties and for folks who may not have been sort of on, on top of it in your twenties, now you're realizing, oh crap, like, right. What is my retirement plan? Cause yeah. I've just been sp spending. Maybe that's similar to, 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 to. And to time you, goes right? by fast. Like when you're in your twenties, you th you're thinking like, oh, I can, there's still a few more years for me to start worrying about this. But then like. 
it, it's not just like a quick turnaround, right? You need to start thinking about it like way in advance for you to be able to save yeah. up however much you want to save up by that time. So it like really creeps up on you. And then before you realize you're like, oh, I haven't done anything with my money. That's a great point. And that's something that I'll touch upon, which is that Yes, t money is a very long term thing. It's not something that can happen overnight. Like even if you want to start saving, you're not going to see those uh, the, that reward and the compounding until much later. So it's one. Of, it's kind of like exercise. Mm -hmm. it, you you don't really see the you don't reap the results or you don't reap the 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 successes until down the road. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's almost like a delayed gratification thing. You're mm -hmm. choosing not to spend today for some intangible unseen benefit in the future right so that's i think that's the part that's really hard for people because it's like climate change it's like you know it's just like it's it's it's, it's supposedly in the future and nothing we do today will have an immediate impact well it's yeah it's because when you spend today you get the immediate impact of your, from yeah, your exactly. spendings <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly okay shall we dive into it and then after that you Let's also have um something that you want to teach us on but we'll get to that Later, I mean, I yeah. will know in the in the episode title what it's about, but let's get right into it. So, first question is: Do you know anyone in your life? You know, a friend, an aunt, an uncle. Hopefully, not your parents, but you, you you talk about it with your friends, or you just talk about it to yourself, which is like, damn, that person is they're so crazy with their money. <laughs> like, <laughs> in terms of whether like they save way too much, you know, they're like counting nickels and dimes or they're spending way too lavishly, like, damn, like how can I afford that? What's going on? <laughs> do you know anyone in your life like that where you think like, damn, they're, they're crazy with their money. I could never do that. Nothing on the like extreme end, but okay. definitely those who would save more, like com in comparison to me, would save more than, than I do and, or would spend more than I do. So but nothing that where I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. Do you yeah. think you're, uh, I think, you, you know, you see some improvement that you think you can implement in your own life, but like, do you think you're pretty uh, reasonable with your money or do you think you might be, I don't know, not crazy, but um, <laughs> do you think people would be like, wow, geez, crazy with her money? <laughs> I think I can definitely, no, I don't think so. I think I can definitely okay. improve like on the budgeting side and things like that, but I'm not like, you know, not crazy in the sense that like, I'm, I'm spending more than what's the most, I have. What, what do you think is the craziest purchase you've made? It doesn't have to be something big, but the craziest yeah, just something where it's, purchase you, you felt like I've this made. is super guilty pleasure. Probably, probably like a handbag that I bought when I was in Italy, because I've used <laughs> it since then. I've used it maybe like less than 10 times. Um, so because like it's something that is so like, like, I'm scared to use it because it's like so expensive. So it's just sitting yeah. there kind of collecting dust. Uh, so, but that was at the time, like something that I thought I really wanted, like I'd wanted this mm -hmm. bag for years. And then once I had it, I'm scared to use it. <laughs> so the point, the first point that the book makes here that I, I wanted to share is Morgan says people do crazy things with money. Right. You, you've seen it, whether even though you don't know anyone personally, like we've all heard the stories in the news and stuff. But the thing is, no one is actually crazy. Obviously, people might do things that you think are crazy with their money, but they're but from their perspective, from their standpoint, they're not actually being crazy about it because we all have different lived experiences. So think about how you grew up how maybe friends that you know, who had very different upbringings, maybe they had much more wealthy upbringings or much uh, poorer upbringings, mm -hmm. all those lived experiences that we've, uh, that we grew up with informs how we relate to money and how, what our views are about how money works. Mm -hmm. Like I certainly know people who have grew up in less fortunate, uh, compared to me circumstances, and they're much more frugal with money. And that makes so much more sense when you understand what their lived experiences are. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I've known people who have been very privileged and they're uh, and it's not always like, you know, perfectly black and white like this, but there's a trend I think I've noticed in my own life, like people who, for example, have lived w with more fortune, uh, growing up and they're less anxious about money. And so when we think about money, it's important to, again, the psychology of money, right? That there's no one objective, like this is right. This is wrong. This is good. This is bad. Mm -hmm. It's just based on your own life experiences that informs how you relate to money. And I think that can really help us understand our peers, our colleagues, our friends, yeah. so we don't judge them, right? Yeah. Well, I think upbringing definitely has 
so much to do with our thinking around money because like I think even I've known people who even grew up in sort of like a more frugal household and now they're making like a lot of money but their spending habits are still sort of like similar to how they were growing up I don't remember if it's Mila Kunis or who I remember there's a celebrity who in an interview was talking about how because of the immigrant background it doesn't matter how rich they are they're still gonna like coupon the shit out of their purchases and like even yeah she doesn't really give her kids uh, Christmas presents. I know that with Mila Kunis because she oh, went yeah, on an interview yeah. with Shaq and Shaq's like, why don't you buy your kids Christmas presents? And she's like, well, they get one or two, but like, I'm yeah. not going to give them everything that they have ever wanted. So point number two, I want to pose a scenario and I want to, I'm interested to see which scenario you were personally most likely to do in terms of uh, an investment strategy. Okay. So I want to know how you would invest. Okay. Okay. From 1900 to 2019, so that's like, what, 119 years? Mm -hmm. So imagine you're, you're alive for 119 years, and yep. during that entire time, <clears throat> you get to invest $1 every month. Or like you have $1 to invest every month. You don't have to invest it right away, but that's the scenario. So in scenario A, you are someone who, good or bad, you're just going to invest $1 every month into, into the stock market. Like not okay. specific stocks, but like... You know, maybe an, an maybe like a not an index fund. I don't think that index funds, but anyway, just the general stock market. Okay. Okay. So you do it at one dollar every month. It doesn't like you. You do it during the Great Depression. You do it during the Great Financial Crisis of two thousand and eight. Right? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You just do it once every month. Or you're someone who's like, okay, I don't feel comfortable like adding more money when the freaking stock market is collapsing. So when it's a recession, I'm gonna stop investing. And then I'll start investing again and put all that money I've saved up once the recession is over. And the third scenario is, that is similar, but you just wait six months because you don't want to be too reactive. So you stop investing six months into a recession and you start investing six months after a recession. Mm -hmm. You're striking a more a, a, a more a better balance there. Mm -hmm. So do you understand the three options? Yeah, I do. So what would you think you would do? <clears throat> Let me just go with the first option. So no. even when the, even when like, you know, your, everything's crashing, you're not going to sell. You're just going to like keep adding money into, into the stock market when everything is crashing. <laughs> I think so. I feel like everything's sort of like ebbs and flows and long-term, like you kind of have to look at the mm -hmm. long-term stuff. So I'm not super like reactive to these. And I, I think most of it is because I don't know enough about it to like be <laughs> reactive. Like it's yeah. not that I'm like being smart or whatever. I just don't haven't learned enough about it to be reactive. But um, yeah, I, I feel like these things take a really long time. So I probably wouldn't be inclined to to react like that. Well, lucky for you, G, that makes you that makes you a good investor. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you won the door prize <laughs> behind door number A. So <laughs> This is actually one of the key principles, I think, of, of, of this book, but just of, I think, any financial book, which is good investing is average returns. So not bad returns, not great returns, but just good average returns over and above average amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's what good investing is. The problem is that many people focus more on the top part of that formula mm -hmm. rather than the bottom part. So the top part is they want to maximize their returns. Mm -hmm rather than focusing on their time horizon. Mm -hmm. So they want maximum returns over a minimum amount of time. Mm -hmm. Whereas good investing, supposedly, is just average returns over an above average amount of time. Mm -hmm. And the reason why this is better is because basically these one-off hits, you know, these stock surges and, and whatnot, th these are not reliable events that can happen repeatedly and consistently over the course of your life. And so you want to do something that is consistent and uh, sustainable over, over the long term. So you want to target average returns and just do it for an insane amount of time. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, famously what, what made Warren Buffett so, so rich. I, yeah. I, I actually don't have the statistic right in front of me, but it's like, I don't know, like 80, 90% of his wealth was, was accrued after he turned 65 or something, just because mm -hmm. he's laid the groundwork for that compounding. And he just... It's like, it's basically the uh, turtle versus the rabbit, the hare, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So statistically, if you did $1 every month and you had those three scenarios, the book calculated, and then you look at how much money these three different scenarios earn, yeah. the scenario which, which you chose, which is the quote unquote correct one, earned almost double at the end 
than mm-hmm. the than this scenario two and three because during that time you have almost fifteen hundred months, and only around three hundred of those months were during a recession, like yeah. that a recession was happening, right? Yeah. So if you just kept your cool during that one fifth of the time, you you will end up with almost double the money compared to people who like like oh my gosh it's recession or like I think it's recession let me stop yeah. What what's the best way you can use money to attain happiness? Like, in what way can you use can money be utilized to increase your quality of life? Buying things. Buying handbags <laughs> in Italy. <laughs> Duh. Buying goods and services. Wait, yeah. Are you joking? Well, no. Isn't that oh, you're one? Not joking. <clears throat> oh. Well, that that's how you can use money. It- isn't it famous? Oh, okay. Isn't it? I thought it's very famously known that buying things is one of the worst ways to increase, improve your quality of life. Increase your happiness. It can, but it's not as effective as, for example, Well, you just said name one way, so that is okay. one No, way. no, no. I said, what's the best way? Oh, I thought you said, what is one way? So it's definitely not buying handbags in Italy. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, based on my own experience, I know that to be true. <laughs> Um, and oftentimes people talk about how like you, it's about spending money on experiences is much more scientifically proven to have uh, a, a longer term uh, positive impact on your uh, happiness, well-being, all that. Mm-hmm. But this book goes one step further. This book talks about how it's having money in order to have the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want is going to give you the highest payout, like per dollar. That's the best way money can improve your quality of life more so Mm -hmm. than how much money you earn, the size of your house, the prestige of your job, because for example, doing something that you love, but on a schedule on someone else's schedule on a schedule that you can't control can often feel the same as doing something that you hate. Mm -hmm. So the studies and science has shown that like the more basically the more control you have over your life and the more freedom you have Mm -hmm. is going to have the highest uh, positive impact on your life and having more money is the one and only way to give you that freedom and control over your life. So you can wake up and be like, what do I want to do today? Freedom, right? A lot of people say that like, if money can buy you freedom, that's, I think also like if you are able to provide for the people that you love, I feel like that's also Mm. one. Well, I mean, there 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 are studies to show that Spending money on others also pays higher dividends on your happiness than spending money on yourself. Mm -hmm. I try to remind myself of that every time I like have to buy some expensive gift or present. (laughs) I'm like, this is going to make me happier. Science has shown this will make me happier. I won't be, and I bought, I recently bought my mom a a new phone and it was very expensive. And I was like, it's going to make me really happy. More expensive (laughs) phone than I would ever buy for myself. I wish I had this phone, but no, no, buying this phone for her is going to make me happy. Okay, so number four, how do you know someone is wealthy? Um, Think of wealthy friends you have. Why do you think they're wealthy? So my initial reaction would be to say that they have like a lot of stuff or they go on a lot of trips or like they do a lot of things. But I don't know, like if you, if I really think about it, there are people who buy a lot of fancy things or go on trips with money that they don't actually have. Or not that they don't have, but they're spending right up to their limit, you know? It's like so, how I don't, you know, everyone knows I'm a famous, you know, Elon and Tesla fanboy. I don't have a Tesla car. It's not because I can't buy one today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's because that's not a good use of my money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It's maybe a bit harder to tell. I, so you, you're, you're very good at this, G. I don't think you need financial gold. I think you're, you're, you, you've, you're hitting all these questions out of the park. No. That's, you've exactly <laughs> got it right. I, I thought you were going to fall for my trick question, but uh, it's, it's not about the cars and the trips and the house, yeah. but that's what we normally do, right? We normally judge someone is wealthy by what we see, the cars they have, the homes they have, the travel photos that they post. But what we can't see is their bank account. And mm-hmm. true wealth, this book says, is what you don't see and what you haven't bought. Another way to think about it is a lot of times people will say, oh, I want to be a millionaire. But in fact, a lot of people, when they say that, it doesn't mean that they want to be a millionaire. It means that they want to spend a million dollars. <laughs> because the, by definition, to be a millionaire means you have a million dollars and you're not spending it. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So the only way to attain 
true wealth is to not spend the money you have, which is very not, I guess, intuitive, especially in this capitalist society. And it's also really diff, and that's also why it's, I think it's really difficult for people to build wealth because it's difficult to learn from what we can't see. We see what we think are wealthy people buying nice cars, going on fancy vacations, but that's the difference between being wealthy and being rich. That's how this book frames it, right? So when you see people have those nice cars and those nice homes and those nice vacations, you see someone who is rich, for sure. There's no denying they have money. But are they wealthy? That's 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 the different thing. I think so. To your point, right? Like, let's say for me, if I just you know spent every single money I have, you know, I could I could live in a penthouse with a Tesla car and go on vacation around the world like you know two months every year. Mm -hmm. But I would have no money left. <laughs> yeah, and that would make me rich but not wealthy. So does he define wealth then just as like the amount of savings you have or what is wealth? Yeah. I mean, it's a book about money and finances, right? So yeah. wealth in the purely financial sense for, for, for this author is how much yeah. money you have in your bank account. Okay. Hm. Yeah. I mean, you can talk about, you know, I'm wealthy because I have so many friends, you know, but we're not yeah, like health is wealth kind of thing. Yeah. 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 He's <laughs> yeah, writing yeah, a financial book. Like right. So I, I just think that's a, such a cru crucial point, I think, because we look around and we oftentimes, oh, maybe I'll just speak for myself. Like, yeah, I get envious. I get jealous of people who have nice things. I'm like, damn, like they're, 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 so, they're so rich. Mm -hmm. But depending on how much they have left over, maybe they have a lot. That's great if they do. Um, it's, it's different. Rich, being rich and being wealthy are two different things. I thought that was a pretty interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So speaking of people who spend a lot on cars and stuff, like or just you know handbags in Italy, well, why do you think it is so hard for people <laughs> to spend less? So I'm just going to keep using that as a running, <laughs> running joke if you haven't realized. <laughs> okay, yes, I have realized that. I have do my you have the bag? Italian, Can you show us on camera? My Italian bag. Oh, it's somewhere in the in the room, show us? Okay. Um, No, I can't. Don't want to grab it right now. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, what was your question? Why is it so hard for people to spend less money? Why that is it so hard for hit of dopamine when they buy something that they really like. <laughs> or just oh. the convenience of it, right? Like, why does you have to spend so much on Uber Eats? Because it's easy. It's convenient. It's convenient. I mean, it just, it gives you that instantaneous happiness sometimes when you buy something. Yeah, no, for sure. That's, that's true. So <laughs> what this book talks about is a little bit more uh, philosophical, which is that the only way you can create savings is by spending less, but the only way you can spend less is if you desire less. Basically, if you had find a way to desire less, then you're going to spend less because you just, I don't need this in my life. I don't want this in my life. You know, you can buy uh, all these desserts and alcohol and sweets or snacks and stuff. Um, but for me, for example, I just don't, I just don't want that stuff. I, don't, I just don't, I don't want coffee. I don't want it is, yeah. a drink. It's so hard to go back down though. I think like once you, once you go up there, it's so hard to come back down. Like if you already started there, then okay, fine. But like, if you already reached a certain level of spending and like things that you like to buy, and then you have to like cut back. So why, so, so let's think about that. Why, why is it so hard beyond, <laughs> oh, I'm just used to it. Is there anything more to that you think? Well, cause you're taking away what you used to have <clears throat> and and that thing was instant and like we talked about like it's like you're taking away something to put it into the longer term but you're not seeing the results right away so it's like mm -hmm. okay well i just you just feel like you're just cutting and cutting and cutting and you're not getting anything i think, I think that that makes sense uh, i definitely agree with it i think what this book talks about it is it, it tries to dive into and peel back even more layers and goes a bit deeper than that mm -hmm. um so I don't think you're, I, I think you're right, but how the book frames it is saving money or being able to save money and spend less is essentially, it's the gap between your ego and your income. You, you will desire less if you care less about what others think of you. Of you. I was going to say the other one is like comparison because <clears throat> you were like comparing what you have and what you're able to buy, especially mm -hmm. like the people that you surround yourself with. If everyone mm -hmm. is living on if this, everyone's like, quite rich. Yeah. Yeah. And like living on this certain level. Yeah. Um, that's really tough. And that's why I really like, I, you know, I'm, I'm someone who always tries out of, to go out of my way to actively and consciously push back against those emotional decisions and influences and societal, societal pressures. And so oftentimes, you know, I have a, a, a really, uh, I, it was a new car when I bought it, but now it's like an old and crappy car and I could 
buy a new car like that today if I wanted to. And I often feel, I mean, I'm, maybe it's being a, maybe it's being a dude. I don't know, but like, I like nice cars just as much as, as any other person or any other guy. And I often feel, I don't know, shame, pressure to be like, oh, especially if I'm like picking people up, especially when I was dating back then, you know, I'm picking, mm. picking my dates up, driving them around. It's kind of, I don't know if embarrassing is the right word, but there's a certain level of pressure for me to be like, oh yeah, my car is not that nice. It's like, it reflects a certain level <laughs> of status and income. But even though I could fix that right away without being too irresponsible about it, I don't want to because I know that this is just my ego and this image that I want to project. And a lot of times you want to spend all this money because you want respect and admiration from, from, from other people. Mm -hmm. But the book argues that you're not going to get respect and admiration this way from the people that you want and that there, and the better way to, to do it is to be kind and to be humble and to be mm -hmm. generous. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're really good at that. Like not sp spending frivolously and reminding yourself that it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, but like, I'll be like, honest, right? I have those emotions. I have those like, oh, I'm not good. I'm not as good. I'm not good enough. Or like, this is not flashy. Or like, I'm picking up my date. I'm like, yeah, I, my, I feel judged, even if, yeah. they're, even if they're not judging me. So like, I have those emotions. I just try not to let it dictate my action. Well, speaking of like, <clears throat> trying to be ruthlessly rational. Number six, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Be happy. We all knew that. Everyone who's listened to at least half an hour of this podcast knows that he has that answer. <laughs> and everyone who's listened to at least half an hour of this podcast knows that David's answer is he would rather be right. As I literally just tried to explain, right? Like, I'm not happy having a shitty car, but I yeah. know that's the right answer. You know? <laughs> like, I'll be happier if I buy myself a new car, but I'm like, no, that's not the rational thing to do. So a very interesting analogy that the book talks about to help explain you know, to help us understand that this is how humans think is fevers. I didn't actually know this, but fevers, having a fever is when your body turns on its, its immune system and helps to, and having a fever helps fight infection. So it is actually rational to want a fever if you have an infection and you're sick, because mm -hmm. that's your body reacting in a positive way to fight it. Right. But it's not reasonable to want a fever because it's painful. It's uncomfortable. Once you have a fever, you want to get rid of it. That's what everyone you know, most people think and feel. And when it, so when it comes to finances, the reality is most people don't want the mathematically optimal strategy. They want the strategy that maximizes for how well they sleep at night, period. And so this really helps us understand people, right? In that we don't often make the most rational decision, even though mm -hmm. we would like to try and think we do. We, mm -hmm. we do whatever feels right. So for example, the, the, the author shares the personal example, which is uh, they probably went out of the way to pay out and buy out their whole, their, their home that they, that they bought. Mm -hmm. And the author really, Morgan really likes the feeling they get from owning their home, even though they know that the opportunity cost from not leveraging their assets with a cheaper mortgage, uh, is something that they had to, you know, forego. And the line that I loved, I sent you from the book is good decisions. Aren't always rational. Mm hmm you probably be like, yeah, done, move on, next point, what is... <laughs> I think that's... Funda I fundamentally and categorically disagree with that, even though I can understand why people would say that. You don't have, any <laughs> you don't, you don't have anything to add? I mean, I, I, I just agree with it. I mean, I think there's a well, lot help, of... Help, help me understand why people are like that. People are like that. Why, why are you like that? Like, how can you knowingly do something that you know, for example, is not practical, but it just makes you feel good. Like drinking alcohol. Everyone knows it's not <laughs> healthy, but you still do it. Why? The act of doing it, I think. It brings it, I don't know. Like if you, if you are always doing the rational thing, don't you think you're losing out on a lot of joy? Maybe that's why I'm so <laughs> low key, not super happy all the time. Ah, yeah, it's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more of like, whether you're more of an, an emotional person or a logical person. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just like, I don't think there's a need to change either one. There's advantages and disadvantages to both ways of thinking, both types of personalities. But like, you should force your, you should, you should, you should be like, I just should force myself to want to be more like happy doing all these things. If that's just your logical brain is just like wired that way, mm -hmm. you know? So. Yeah. 
Well, I guess I'll keep on putting a limit on how I spend my money and make my decisions. <laughs> also, uh, just but back to the alcohol thing, alcohol doesn't actually bring you happiness. So it wouldn't work yeah, for you true, even if true. that was yeah, like, yeah. even if you were more emotional. <laughs> so I'll give an example of how I'm not so, you know, not perfect, but like not so rational, which is like, you know, I, I, I binge Netflix and I watch, spend time on, on social media and stuff, even mm -hmm. though I know a lot you know, rationally, it's a waste of my time, but it makes me mm -hmm. feel good. So I still do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wake up and I don't get out of bed right away, even though I can, and because it feels good. And even though I know I should get up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not totally rational. Well, most of the time, out. the logical thing doesn't give you that hit of dopamine that you need. Or but want. you know, speaking of motivation, not motivation, but discipline and all the things we talk about in this pod and the self-help books that we read, that's what separates you, I think, from getting to the future and the living the life that you want, which is discipline is managing your emotions is doing the hard thing when you don't want to, right? It's the cold mm -hmm. showers, it's doing presentations at work. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about a balance, you have to find ways to overcome, but I guess you can't be ruthlessly un un uncompromising, because it's just not practical, then where's the joy in life? It's my favorite word, balance. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I think like almost like every week, it's just me lamenting how I don't have an, how I essentially, I don't have balance in my life. Cause I'm trying to be all that. And then G being like, be more balance. Like <laughs> no, really not. Anyways, I, there was a couple other points, but, um, I, I think we basically covered everything. Uh, so hopefully people found that a little bit interesting thinking about sort of the psychology of money. Mm -hmm. Um, I think mm -hmm. one of my personal, just main takeaways from the book is, is actually what we just talked about, which is. I'm always just thinking, well, money is a practical thing. There's no point being emotional about it, especially if you're, you know, talking about it with your partner. Um, you know, how do you split, how do you split bills? How do you split your finances? Yeah. But ultimately we are living in a, you know, an unpredictable world and irrational world for people who make irrational decisions. So I think this book helps me have greater compassion and patience for people who don't think like me when it comes yeah. to Yeah. I mean, money itself is the logical part, I suppose, but what people do with money, how people think about money, that's the, mm. that's the emotional part. Um, mm. One thing I think, I, I don't know if the book talks about this, but we talked about it before, you know, like the whole short-term thinking versus long-term thinking kind of thing, like the, the schools of thought where some people are more like, YOLO, I could die tomorrow, and then all this money that I've saved would be gone, I don't, so mm. I'm going to spend, um, mm -hmm. and I'll just make more money, um, mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. the people who are like, oh, I need to save, I need to think about my future, things like that, so... Mm. I always remember that there's two types of well, people out there. Well, well, well to, to, to be fair, the book really passionately argues for the case for saving money. Mm -hmm. Because saving money is how you have control over your life, which is the highest dividend money can pay. Saving money will help you plan for the unexpected, which the book spends so much time talking about is the key to, the key to understanding life, which is life is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And so you need to save money for reasons that you do not know right now. Mm -hmm. Things that you do not know and cannot anticipate. Well, interesting, interesting book. I'm glad it helped you uh, get to that emotional side of money and spending. Yeah. I mean, personally, I didn't have actually too many uh, impactful takeaways from the book. I actually give it three stars because a lot of the things the book said were com was common sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't like come mm -hmm. away and be like, wow, this is all new information. I think mm -hmm. because I'm like weirdly logical that way, it was like, yeah, this is all intuitive this makes sense a lot of people. yeah yeah hey everyone david here our conversation on the psychology of money ended up going a little bit longer than we had anticipated so we're actually going to just wrap up the conversation this week here and next week we will release the remainder of our conversation we recorded on these lessons on and next week we'll have G share her insights on a book she recently read about how to train your brain and to memorize things better to read faster fascinating topic thanks so much everyone for tuning in this week stay tuned for next week's continuation of this recorded podcast episode have an awesome rest of your week